lovely fellow time travellers, I know you're there. I'm so glad you are as we travel together through space and time. This week's podcast is about the First World War, the Great War, the war that was supposed to end all wars. Uh, In many ways, I've said this over and over, the First World War and my family connection to it is my doorway into history. My grandfathers both survived that war. They fought and survived. And because I am connected to that global event by family, it opened my eyes to the fact that history is all of our business. It belongs to all of us and we are all part of the big story. Uh, That's why history is important to me. Or it it was the gateway drug the enormity, the unimaginable scale and unspeakable consequences of the First World War play on my mind to this day. To help support this podcast series and get extra exclusive content every week, sign up to my patreon.com site. Just go to patreon.com and follow the rules. You look for me by name, you part with a bit of cash and you join the family of interested, curious uh, history lovers. Be great to see you there. Okay, it's time to strap into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop in my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. that were inflicted on the population, on our civilization, on our psychology as a species, I think those wounds are forever. In this episode, your country needs you. Britain has to raise a new army. Horatio Kitchener, the Secretary for War, puts out the call for volunteers. Among them all, five strong brothers who work together on their local manor estate. They answer the call. A call to a war like no other, on a scale never seen before. New weapons and technology wreaking a terrible harvest. For the family of the five brothers and for these islands as a whole, the toll of the Great War was too much to bear. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you and me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last episode we travelled to the Isle of Skye, a breathtakingly beautiful island washed in heaven's tears. Where are we this week? Yes, Paul, we've come to a part of my journey that always affects me deeply. Uh, The great magnitude and tragedy of the First World War that they also called the Great War. It affected so many people then and it affects us still whether we know it or not. In this episode we're looking at one particular family and how the war ripped their lives apart. Heartbreak writ large. This week, we're meeting the Souls family in the village of Great Rissington in Gloucestershire. The location, Paul, is a little church. It's called St John the Baptist Church, and it's in the village of Great Rissington in Gloucestershire. A very pretty place, but in all, also in many ways a sort of place that would just be overlooked. And had it not been perhaps for the events of the First World War, I might never have known the place existed. The last love letter was uh, was from Portree on Sky, where we followed in the footsteps of the 28 men from Portree who went off to the First World War, and so many of them paid the ultimate price. Well, it was by way of illustrating the impact of the First World War on communities. And this story that comes out of, or that I have located in St John the Baptist Church in Great Rissington in Gloucestershire, is to show that, obviously, it certainly wasn't just the Western Highlands of Scotland. 
the wounds of the First World War were scattered across the world like so much shrapnel. You know, there was hardly anywhere avoided it. So, as we noted last week, Portree lost 20 to the Great War out of a population of just 900 and odd people. Well, in many ways, contemplate this. From this one Cotswold village of Great Rissington, the Soul's family lost five sons. Five sons. You know, you could absolutely justifiably call them lost souls. You know, the film, the movie Saving Private Ryan, it's all about an attempt to save the last surviving son of the Ryan family because he's, he's, all of his brothers have been killed already and the government has decided that they can't allow all of a mother's sons to die. So they, they go and find Private Ryan so they can take him home. Well, this is... And it, it, it was based on some kind of truth, Saving Private Ryan. And there was another incident like it in the American Civil War where it was noticed that one family had had lost all its boys. It happens. These global conflicts are on such a scale that of course it happens. If a family has sons of the required age to join up or to to be conscripted, then if they're in the wrong places at the wrong times, then it can happen. So who were the souls of Great Rissington? Well, their parents were William and Annie. William Souls, the father, was a a farm labourer, just living a simple life. They had six sons and three daughters, and they lived in what you call a tied house because he was a labourer. As long as he had his job, a house came with the job. You call that a tied house, and that's where they lived. Great Rissington, it's very pretty, very traditional place. It had a village green and a little school, and that's where they lived. There were six sons, But five were old enough at the outbreak of war to get involved. And so the the five were Frederick, who was their eldest son. And then there were identical twins, Alfred and Arthur. They had been born an hour apart. And Walter and Albert. The sixth son was Percy, but he was underage. He was too young to go off, and so he... He stayed behind, no doubt bitterly disappointed to not be involved in the adventure when it first started to kick off, because that's what so many people thought it was going to be. So many young men and boys were frantic that they might miss out. And so many underage boys lied because they were desperate not to miss out on what they thought was going to be this grand adventure. At the time, the five boys, they all worked on the local estate. There was a a local land owner and uh, they all had various jobs and if the war had never happened, you would imagine that young lads from a place like Great Rissington, they would just have lived quiet lives. I remember when I read about them at the time that there was a little story, an anecdote, that they had all carved their names into the beam of a barn, that somewhere there's the proof of life, the evidence that they ever existed but uh, I was never able to to track it down any more than that. So, when war broke out, Britain was was really in no state to fight a major sustained conflict. It just didn't didn't have the technology, and it didn't have the men. It didn't have the trained men really available. There was a professional army, but it was too small, and so... Horatio Herbert Kitchener, who was the Secretary of State for War, he he put out a famous call for volunteers. Everyone will have seen those posters of moustache, richly moustachioed Kitchener pointing, you know, your country needs you, so that the onus was on everyone. Everyone was expected to join up. Although Frederick was the eldest, it was Albert and Walter, who were the younger of the five, they were the first to sign up and they joined what was the 2nd Battalion Worcestershire Regiment, just one of the local forces that was recruiting at the time. Albert was the youngest of the Souls boys, the youngest to put on the uniform, and he was also the first to die. He died fighting on the 14th of March, 1916.
1916 was when Kitchener's volunteer army formed up, and by God, they formed up. The recruiting stations couldn't cope. They were queuing around the block to come in. Tens and then hundreds of thousands joined up through, you know, 1915, and it was really into 1916 and running towards the Somme, the great charnel house of the Somme. That was really where so many of that new volunteer army met its destiny. But Albert was before that. Albert fought and died and was, was in the ground by the 14th of March, 1916. Frederick, the eldest boy, and the twins, Alfred and Arthur, they joined a different regiment. They joined the 16th Cheshire Regiment. Fred died at the Somme in July 1916, and like so many others, his body was never found, and his name is simply listed among the missing of the Somme. There's a quite extraordinary memorial come monument at Teepval, which records the missing of the Somme. And it's a huge, it's like a, I remember being there with my dad once long ago and he described it as being like a cathedral without walls. And, and so it is, it's all arches, it's open. And so there are lots of towering archways and then you step inside and there are pale stone plaques and engraved into them are these, well, 70 odd thousand names. And they've gone down in history as the missing of the Somme, but it, it's a myth. It was a legend that was allowed to grow up to cover for basically a bureaucratic cock-up. At the start of the Battle of the Somme, all these volunteer soldiers, they, they were all wearing, as all British soldiers wear, a single dog tag. You know, an identity tag with their name on it and their number. And the British Army doesn't pay dead soldiers. So when a soldier died, one of the first things that was done was his dog tag was taken so that they could be sure to stop his pay. Okay. Really? Yeah, the Brit well, of course. They, they, they don't pay dead soldiers, so from the moment you die, you stop earning. So it was it was of bureaucratic importance to collect the dog tags of the dead. And of course, in the first day of the Battle of the Somme, nearly twenty thousand men were killed on the same day. And all those dog tags piled up. You know, there was this obscene log jam. The burial parties couldn't keep up with what happened at the Somme. That mechanised warfare, the machine guns and the shells and all the rest of it, they couldn't get the bodies into the ground quick enough. And so the bodies started to pile up, literally, and they started to decompose. And eventually, because they had no identity tags, the army knew who was dead, but they could no longer put a name to each body. They had all the dog tags. But because they had been separated from their bodies, nobody knew who was who among the dead. And so they had to just have these mass graves and then they put their names up on this great memorial. And it has engraved around the top of it, the missing of the Somme. You're invited to think that, you know, all these men stepped out into no man's land and just disappeared. But they didn't. It was just the, the bureaucracy and the the burial parties they had not foreseen and couldn't cope with the volume that suddenly fell upon them at the Somme. And military protocol was changed forever because from that time on and to this day, the soldiers have two dog tags, two duplicates. So if you're killed, they take away one to stop your pay and they leave the other with you so that when the burial party gets to you, they can make sure you've got a headstone with your name on it. And that was all a product of the Somme. The mammoth tragedy of that, Neil, is just mind-boggling. But yeah, well, it, it's part of what it's part of what I always say. It, it's too much. You can't take. I mean, imagine something like that happening today. You know, we are rightly appalled when a soldier dies now. Any soldier, and sometimes there'll be a, an incident somewhere, and maybe a few will die together in some sort of, maybe an ambush or a firefight or whatever. But 19,000, nearly 20,000 men died in the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Imagine that news coming back to Britain today. 
It's just, it's, it's entirely unthinkable. Well, Fred, Fred Souls was one of those. Uh, his body was never found. Or let's say his body went into a mass grave somewhere without anybody knowing who he was. They knew that Frederick Souls was dead, but like so many of the rest, they probably just couldn't identify him anymore. You know, and it is, it is absolutely harrowing. Walter was the next. He was wounded at the Somme a month after Frederick, and he died in a field hospital there. So he wasn't killed outright, and he was carted off the field of battle and into a field hospital, but he, he, he succumbed, died of wounds. Then Alfred, Alfred was killed in April 1918 at Plug Wood. Arthur, the next, he won the military medal during a, a desperate battle, a desperate fight to try and hold the villers Bretonneux Plateau. But he was cut down and died of wounds in the same month as his twin. So they were born an hour apart and they, they died in the same month. Now, there's just a few lines. What can you say, really? I mean, there, there, there are only a few lines to describe what happened to those souls, boys. It's worth saying their names again. Frederick, the twins Alfred and Arthur. Walter and young Albert, the first, the first of them to die. But there's little really that you can say about them. But then, you know, I invite you to contemplate what happened to the souls back home in Great Rissington, to William and to Annie and to Percy and to their sisters, when one by one, week after week and month after month, those tragic telegrams were turning up so that eventually five of the six boys were dead. And what, what was done? You know, they're just one family, one family, and, and, and the loss to any and every family was unbearable. Two centuries before the First World War, there was the, the War of the Spanish Succession. And one of the, one of the great victors there uh, was John Churchill, who was made first Duke of Marlborough in the aftermath of the battle at Blenheim. And he was given the money by a grateful nation to build what we have now as Blenheim Palace. That was his reward. He was titled and he was given the money to build, you know, by today's standards, millions of pounds to build Blenheim Palace, you know, because he was high born. He was one of the elite uh, that the nation tends to shower its gratitude upon. Well, back in Great Rissington after the war, Annie Souls was given a shilling a week as compensation for each of her dead boys. And uh, believe it or believe it not, the people of Great Rissington, the people around her, started to gossip that Annie was doing quite well out of the First World War because she was getting five shillings a week for her dead sons. And eventually the, the talk was too much, the gossip was too much, and the remnants, what remained of the family, they, they moved away to another village, Great Barrington. And Percy, the last son, last and youngest of the Soul Brothers, died of meningitis a couple of years after the end of the war, so that Annie and William had lost all their sons, five to the war and one to meningitis. And amongst what little we know about it, they say that Annie Souls never stood for God Save the King, never stood for the national anthem, and who could blame her? And if you go there today, Great Rissington, it's a beautiful little place. The 2011 census gave it a population of 367 people. The houses in, in that way, in that part of England, they're largely, the older houses are built of pale stone and the roofs are, are sort of mossy slate. Neat hedges, well-kept gardens. And the, the village green is still there. There's a cricket ground. Some parts of the, the local pub, the Lamb Inn, are, are apparently more than 300 years old. So it's a, it's a place of some history and very, very photogenic. It's a postcard-perfect village, parts of it. And then there's St John the Baptist Church that goes all the way back to the 12th century. 
It sits up on high ground, as churches often do, they're often given a prominent location, and it sits up high on a natural, a natural rise. And on, on one side of the church, there's an avenue of trees that leads to the manor house, the headquarters, if you like, of the estate where the souls boys worked before the war. And then on the other side of it, there's a, a Georgian rectory. It's all very attractive. And if you go into the church, on the north wall, opposite the main door that you go in, there's a war memorial. It's a, a slab of pale grey stone. And it has on it the names of the Souls brothers and the names of seven other men and boys from Great Rissington who died during the war. So that was the toll that was taken on that little village. 367 people in 2011, well, probably just a few hundred at the time of the war, and they lost, well, the five Soul brothers and then seven others. And under the names of the dead, there's a line from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. And it's easy, easy if you say it quick, but, you know, I don't really think that for families like the souls that death is swallowed up by anything, not by victory. And there are photographs. There are photographs of the boys, the souls boys. And it's, it has, it's that weird effect, you know, they're forever young. They're just like all the rest, you know, they're just young men. And, and so many of them, one of the, one of the effects of the, of the First World War was so many of them died before they had time to be, to be married or to have children or families. And so most of them, or so many of them, if their graves were visited at all, they were visited by nephews and nieces because they didn't have descendants. They were removed from the population completely. You know, so that so many of them didn't even have the chance to leave behind descendants. And it's that strange effect, you know, after a hundred years and more, you're confronted by these young faces. At this time of year, I think often about the poetry of... Um, it's a particular poem by Humbert Wolfe. Amongst others, he wrote Requiem for the Soldier. Down some cold field in a world uncharted, the young seek each other with questioning eyes. They question each other, the young, the golden-hearted of the world that they were robbed of in their quiet paradise. And so they were. The Souls boys were robbed of their quiet paradise in Great Rissington. And again, like the, like the men of Portree, what happened to the Souls family, what happened to countless families around the British archipelago, it was too much to bear. How could anyone readily or easily ever get beyond it? And I've said before and I'll say again, you know, more than a, more than a hundred years now, well over a hundred years since the end of the war, you might be invited to think that we've moved on. Uh, but in reality, I think the scars of the First World War and the Second World War are for all time. The wounds that were inflicted on the population, on our civilization, on our psychology as a species, I think those wounds are forever. You often talk about finding a way into understanding history through the details. And as you were so movingly talking about this family, it triggered my mind to think about your own grandfathers, who you talked about in the previous episode, and I could suddenly see a fraction of them. Mm. It's so difficult to grasp the reality of all this, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it's... I, obviously, I was a, I was a little boy when I... And my, when I was a little boy, my, my dad's dad was the only one of my grandfathers who was still alive... And he was in his 70s, and 70, when I was a little boy, I don't know, it seemed a lot older than 70 does now. He was ancient to my eyes. Um, and a, my mum's dad, who was wounded at Gallipoli, he, he died in his 50s, long before I was born. And, and people didn't have so many photographs in those days. You know, I've only ever really seen a, a handful of photographs of, of my mum's dad. His name was James Cameron Neal. My mum is uh, Norma Agnes Cameron Neal, and, and that's why I'm Neal. It's very much a Scottish tradition to maintain mother's maiden names as first names of children. 
My middle name is Patterson, and Patterson is my dad's mum's maiden name. So I'm, I'm made, I'm made up of, I'm made up of other people's names. So he was gone, and, and all I ever saw were a few photographs of him. And, and Grandpa was just this very old man, and so it, it was always very difficult for me. It's difficult, full stop, to try and imagine Grandpa as a soldier, because he was always this old man with, you know, balding, really almost completely bald, but with just some white fluffy hair at the sides of his, around his temples. When I tried to picture Grandpa, you know, going to battle at the Somme. It was Private Godfrey from Dad's army that I would see. I, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't make him into a young man. And again, absence of photographs. I only ever remember seeing one photograph of Grandpa as a young man. And so their, their youth, you know that Humbert Wolf poem, you know, it, it's the spirits of the dead that are talking. Uh, their hearts are not changed and they, and they call to one another. Are they young with our youth, gold with our gold, my brother? Do they smile in the face of death because we died? You know, and I, I think about that. Are they young with our youth, gold with our gold? Because their youth is old now, their youth is age, and their gold is grey. And when you're confronted at the memorial in St John the Baptist Church in Great Rissington, and you're confronted by these young men, their youth was utterly lost, you know, because they didn't grow old. They were just cut down like newly grown grass. They were just harvested. And it's 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 difficult. It's difficult to populate the First World War with real living, breathing people. Yeah, it's so difficult to put real people in that real history, isn't it? But when you said your grandpa had been at the Somme, I could picture him there. And not as an mm. old man, because I didn't know him, but I saw him as a young mm. man. Yeah. What they went through. Yeah. All yeah. seems so unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is, and you know, he was. It's amazing to me as well that he was, like, my mum's dad was was shot by friendly fire at Gallipoli, and he he shot by a British bullet by accident, and he was out and invalided home, and you know, he was so badly hurt he could he couldn't go back to the war. But but Grandpa, it, it, we don't really know because he, he he didn't keep a diary, he didn't do any of the sort of you know famous things. He didn't. And he never talked about it, and so, and then he was dead, and we didn't really know. But the sketchy information that we had was that he was hurt at least twice. So he was hurt on the Menin Road, going into Menin, and something called that they used to call a whiz bang, which is a small explosive, like a, you know, fired from a from a gun somewhere, and it exploded close enough to Grandpa that th this was the one that put the shrapnel in his ear that made him deaf. He, did, he had this piece of shrapnel behind his ear for the rest of his life. And then he was hurt to Albert. He was caught in fighting again. And both times he was sent home to Britain and both times he ended up back in, the, back in France. <laughs> you know, they just patched him up and sent him back out, you know. It's all just so sort of unthinkable. But again, he survived. We think he went in about 19... He was conscripted in 1916. He was part of the big call-up. And he was in the... What was the Ayrshire Yeomanry, um, which became the Royal Scots Fusiliers. And, you know, he, he served until the end of the war. And he'd worked as a warehouse man in a, a supermarket that was that's now defunct. It was called Cooper's. Like a grocer's, but like a supermarket in the days before supermarkets. And he went back to working in Cooper's. And when he retired, when he was 65, he got a gold watch, and I've got his gold watch. And it, and it has, it's engraved on the back. It's not, a, it's not a pocket watch, it's a wrist watch. And it has on the back his name and the dates of his employment. And his employment starts in 1913, and then it ends in the 1950s. And so his service in the First World War is kind of, is in there. So even when he was in the war, the Coopers were sort of counting him as a, as a missing employee. Always used to make me smile. Yeah, but, you know, his is just one life out of millions. I said the other day, it's worth repeating, if the British and Empire dead of the First World War were to march four abreast down Whitehall, it would take them three and a half days to pass the Cenotaph. The line of men would stretch from London to Edinburgh. Wow. All the way up the road, from London to Edinburgh. It's just unthinkable. And because it's impossible, I say again, 
in order to conceive of the hurt that was done, you've got to make it about individuals and individual families. Hence the men from Portree, whose deaths tore such a hole in that world. And then the loss of five sons. You, if you've got children, if you've got sons and you've watched them grow up and you've loved them and, you know, and bathed them as babies and put on their clothes for them and fed them and, and, and seen them get an education and, and grow up and then for five of them to go off to war and be killed is just... How does the world trick itself into thinking you can move on from that kind of hurt? I just don't think it can. I just think those wounds are forever. And that's the tale of the lost souls. Appalled by the number of casualties, troubled that the dead were not being recorded properly, one man began keeping note the process of remembrance began. The 11th of November 1919 was the first anniversary of the war's end. The public's actions demanded that the temporary cenotaph on Whitehall be made permanent. Grief propelled the largest public art project ever seen as communities across the land took it upon themselves to build their own local memorials to remember their dead. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter and please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book, it's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>